Little Nguyen before we before we get started. Yai die 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 I die, 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 Oh, yeah, I die, 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 I die, 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 so it is such an honor and joy to welcome everyone this evening. Amazing um, to see all these faces. Um, I actually want to encourage you if you're comfortable and you don't have your video feed on yet to, um, if you're willing, turn it on at least for a little while so Art can see all your faces. That would be really meaningful. Um, Thank you so much for being here um, to celebrate our teacher Art on the occasion of his 80th birth birthday, which uh, he just recently um, crossed that threshold. And I also wanna say Art, thank you for letting us be here tonight uh, <laughs> to celebrate with you on this occasion. Um, as I was looking at the names of people uh, registered for this evening, and as I'm looking now at the faces on the screen, on the many screens, um, I am struck yet again by art, the worlds that you bring together, the worlds that you bridge and bring together. Um, the world of academic scholarship in the world of the Beit Midrash, the world of institutional Jewish life and of anti-institutional Jewish <laughs> life, uh, the world of your teachers from Eastern Europe and the world of your students in North America and Israel and around the globe, the worlds of Jerusalem and Boston and Berkeley and Philadelphia and Chicago and the antique shops of Western Massachusetts and uh, so many other places around the world. Um, the world of political activism and the world of devoted spiritual practice, uh, the worlds of seekers of all faiths. It's only fitting, of course, uh, for us to celebrate tonight by learning together. And so I'm going to turn things over to Art in just a minute. Uh, but before I do, I want to I want to say just a word about two other worlds that you have taught us to bring together. And um, you've done so insistently and urgently and faithfully. Uh, and those are the worlds of knowledge and of life. Um, as you've written and as you've taught us by example, uh, your life has been about a quest for a way of learning that might heal the breach between the tree of knowledge and the tree of life, between learning and wisdom, 
and you've sought and you've taught an approach to the sources and approach to the Jewish sources that demonstrates what it means to learn uh, for the sake of inner growth, what it means to learn in a way and to seek truth in a way that broadens and deepens the human spirit. In bringing together these worlds, you've had a profound influence on my own life and uh, on our work here at Hebrew College, and I suspect on um, so many of the people who are gathered here this evening. So we're honored to have the opportunity to learn with and from you this evening, and also to have an opportunity to learn with and from your dear friend and colleague, Dr. Michael Fishbane, Nathan Cummings, Professor of Jewish Studies at the University of Chicago, and also I have to add, esteemed Hebrew College alumnus. Um, uh, he'll also offer some, uh, some of his own remarks and reflections after Art's teaching this evening. So thank you so much, and Art Bechavot. Wow. <laughs> Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, thanks to you, Sharon, for organizing this. Uh, to my dear friend, Buzzy, for responding. I um, also want to thank two dear friends who are not here tonight. Um, and they are, they are Limor Rubin and Tamar, Rabbi Tamar Elad Applebaum, because this was all their idea. It was my Israeli, it was my Israeli friends and, 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 and disciples who said, let's have an evening like this for the public, for people who don't know you. We already had a birthday celebration for some, for some closer friends, but let's have something for the public. It turns out to my great delight, surprise and delight, I am being fairly widely read in something called the Mechinot Kedam Tzvayot, groups of 18 year olds in Israel before they go into the army have, have discovered me. And uh, so a bunch of those people and other Israeli readers will come together in a few weeks in Hebrew but once I told Sharon about that, she said, we've got to do it in English as well. <laughs> so that's sort of the real goal of how, of how this evening happened. And I'm really delighted to see you all. And especially, especially people I haven't seen in a long time, dear friends, um, dear friends, former students. It's really a great pleasure and honor that you have, that you have come here to be with me. Um, I want to uh, begin with two comments that have to do with turning 80. Um, and then from those go into what the evening really is, which is, what do I really want to teach? What do I really have to say? And I'm going to do that in a particular way, which I'll explain to you as we go along. Shana, could we have the first, uh, the first screen? We're going to do some sort of a, a PowerPointy things that I don't usually do. We're beginning with a quote from my dear, very dear friend, Melilla Helner Eshed, who's writing, who's written a book about the Idrot, about the most obscure, difficult parts of the Zohar. The, in the Idrot, the Zohar leaves the schema of the 10 Sfirot behind and instead has five faces of divinity, which are really what it's all about. God is, God is present in these five different ways. And she writes, uh, she, I, I read it in Hebrew, but it's now coming out. Stanford will publish it in English uh, uh, quite soon. It will be the second book, by the way, in Stanford's Jewish mysticism series, the first book, is just coming out this month, which is my translation of Mora and Ayim. It's now available, The Light of the Eyes. And um, I'll tell you more about that later. Uh, Melilla writes, the long face of divinity, Arich Anpin, is also known as the ancient holy one, or the ancient of days. This is the primal and unitive face of divinity. Being that precedes, and I add and underlies all of reality. This face white as snow radiates life, love, freedom, and forgiveness beyond border. It contains no judgment, reactivity, or stricture. It's what I feel about being over 80. I'm, I'm now Atika Kadisha, you know, I'm now, I'm now Atik Yomi and I'm in the ancient place. And that means I'm sort of beyond, beyond having needs and beyond having, having to, react, to react to things or react to to, uh, to things that happen in the world. All I really want to do is, uh, is, radiate, is radiate some life and love and freedom and forgiveness and, and be with people and give to people. Um, it feels like a moment, a moment of pure chesed because uh, 
Ten years ago, I read the pasuk very, very hard that said, The days of our lives are 70. And 70 was a big kick in the butt and said to me, what do you still want to get done? And my 70s have been my most productive decade until now, because the answer was a whole lot. And 80 feels like, you know, that uh, that um, that in big so maybe, maybe by power, by dint of power, you get to 80. But once you're over 80, it's all pure chesed. It's all a gift. There's no, I haven't earned it. Certainly not by the way I've treated my body all these years, God knows. Uh, it feels like a completely undeserved gift. And so all I want to do is give back. All I want to do, all I want to do at this point is give. And, um, and that feels like, that feels like a very lovely place to be. And that's a, that's a sort of, that's introduction number one. Introduction number two, now we'll get to, now we'll get to something else. Uh, Shana, switch the switch for us, please. Um, so the Talmud says in Brachot, Luchot v'shivrei luchot monachim ayu ba'aron. Both the whole and broken tablets were placed in the ark. If you look at the context of the Talmud, the reason I bring it up, or I feel I have a right to bring it up, is because it really says, take great care to respect the elders, the, an elder who has forgotten his teaching. Because both Luchot and Shivrei Luchot, whole and broken tablets, were placed in the ark. Thank God I haven't reached that state yet. I haven't yet forgotten. But that will come. You know, there will be a day. It may take me a little longer than it took, even a little longer than it took before, to remember everybody's name. And, um, and I, I, I look at that and I say, whole and broken tablets. I, I have to say, I picture Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu with his little crew of Levites, sending them around to pick up all the pieces of the broken tablets after he smashed them at the foot of the mountain. We don't know how many pieces he smashed them into, but I imagine these Levites on the hunt for broken pieces so they could put them into the ark. Now, I believe the broken tablets were placed in the ark for a generation like ours, because we are not capable anymore of learning from whole tablets. We can only learn, our truth comes in small pieces. I don't think, just as I can't be an Orthodox Jew, though I've become, as many of you know, pretty observant these days, I can't call myself an Orthodox Jew, the same way I couldn't call myself an Orthodox Freudian, an Orthodox Marxist, an Orthodox Jungian, because an Orthodox Hegelian, because it's all, truth comes in small packages. All the grand systems have failed us. Kabbalah was once a grand system of truth like that. It began to break down in the 18th century. And Hasidism in some ways came about because of that breakdown. So all we have, all we have are small pieces, our fragments. And each of us puts the tradition together in our own way. Each of us puts the Luchot together in our own way from the fragments of tablets. What I want to do this evening, this is the introductory statement. What I want to do this evening is share with you some of the fragments of the broken tablets that have spoken to me most. All I'm going to do is quote phrases from the tradition, a group of phrases from the tradition, and talk to you about what they mean to me and why they've been important and what these broken tablets are, what these pieces of the broken tablets are, and how somehow they have come together for me into, uh, into being a Judaism that works for me. So with that introduction, we'll now turn to the first one. Since we're talking about the beginning of the tablets, the first one was obvious to me. Shana? The first two commandments, I am and have no other, we heard from powerful divine speech. Those really came from the mouth of God. All the rest came through Moses. This comes about because of a gematria. The Talmud doesn't use a very many gematriot, but in Makot it does. And it says, Torah tzivalanu Moshe. Moses commanded us the Torah. The word Torah in gematria is 611. So Moses commanded us 611 commandments. What about the other two? Why aren't there 613? The traditional number, because Anochi v'lo yelecha mi piya We heard those two commandments from the divine mouth itself. What does that mean? There's a tradition that all the commandments are then are then rooted in the first two. 
all the positive commandments supposedly come from Anochi, I am, and all the negative commandments are rooted in lo yelecha, in, in forbidding and forbidding um, uh, idolatry. Those two commandments contain the entire Torah. But still I ask, what does it mean? I don't know a God who speaks words. I don't know a God who speaks in language. I don't know a God who speaks all 613 commandments. I also don't know a God who verbally speaks these two. But I believe these two are spoken directly from the mouth of God, which to me means the inner mouth, of course, the voice that speaks within us. I think being human gives us an instinct parallel to what animal instinct is, parallel even to what instinct is in the plant life. There's nothing in the plant kingdom, there's nothing in, 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 in botany that says God speaks to trees. But trees know somehow to reach up through the forest so they can get a little bit of that sunlight. They know to send their roots down where, to the place where they can get water. If you believe this, uh, this very interesting botanist in Germany who studies forests, they even help one another find those places. Um, animals have a voice with, inside them that says, that says, eat, thrive, reproduce, eat, thrive, reproduce. That's all the word, that's all the living word of God to me. That's all the, the living word. You may call it the voice of evolution. You may call it the, you may call it nature. The word doesn't matter to me. Because of the development of the human brain and what I call the human soul, we also have a voice within us, the same kind of voice that says, figure it out. What are you doing here? Why do you exist? Why do you exist? How does it happen that you occupy this stage of existence for this, for this instant in evolutionary time? Passing genes on from your grandparents to your grandchildren and passing on cultural legacy, just like you pass on the genetic legacy. What's it all about? Figure it out. That word is the first word God says to human beings in Gan Eden, in the Garden of Eden, Ayeka. God says to Adam, where are you? Well, that where are you is said again in the form of Anochi, because it's that, here's how I translate. Anochi velo yelecha mi piya Oh, Awareness of the underlying oneness of being sets you free from all your narrow places. Don't betray it and worship anything less. Once more, awareness of the underlying oneness of being, Anochi, is what sets you free from all your narrow, constricted places. Don't betray it by worshiping anything else. Of course, the Abu Dazara of our time is not, uh, is not uh, is not sticks and stones. It's not. It's not. It's not idols, uh, in the literal sense. But it is all the other forms of avodah zarah we have that our society is so filled with: the worship of money, the worship of physical beauty, the worship of the big, the drug of choice in our Jewish community is the drug of success. The worship of success, all those things, all those things that take the place of, of, uh, of, 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 of yudhe vavhe of being itself, of the ultimate, of the ultimate one of being. All of those, all of those come and come and take it away. So, so that's the whole of religion for me. That's the whole of religion for me. The rest is commentary. The rest is commentary. As Hillel said, Idach Pevusha Zilgmor. The rest is commentary, go and learn. The rest comes through Moshe Rabbeinu. The rest comes through Moshe Rabbeinu. He's a human being. He's therefore fallible. Yes, he was influenced by the culture of his times. There are things he forbade that we wouldn't forbid today. There are attitudes he had that we wouldn't have today. There are things that are said in his name or that he said, if he is a, you can put the he in quotation marks if you want. There are things that, that he said that, that horrify us today. But they're all they're all part of the tradition. They're all part of the past. That's where we come from. We can't deny them because they're where we come from, even though we can certainly select as I have, as I do, as I say, these are my these are my broken tablets. Uh, there are pieces I pick up from the broken tablets and pieces I don't. 
but these are these are some of my favorites. So that's the first. I'm going to share with you five, initially five. That's the first of these five. Um, and the second now is Klaal Gadol Batora. This wonderful argument that, that Rabbi Akiva and his friend Ben Azai have it in Rushal Minidarim, where Rabbi Akiva says, Love your neighbor, that's the most basic rule of Torah. And Klaal Gadol doesn't just mean a big principle, it means the big principle. That's what it's all about. Love your neighbor as yourself. And when I was a kid, we learned to sing that. Yes, in summer camp, we learned to sing. But Benazi says to him, he has the nerve to say to him, I know a better, a bigger principle than that. And that is on the um, uh, Genesis 5, 1, I believe, on the day when God made human beings, uh, he made them all in his image, male and female, he created them which is to say every human being is the image of God. That's the Klaal Gadol. That's what Torah is there to help make real. That's what Torah is there to teach us. The machloket between them may have, I have two ways of interpreting it. First, maybe, maybe Ben Azai is saying to Akiva, love is too much to demand. Some of us have very bad neighbors, very tough neighbors. We Jews have had very tough neighbors and many times in our history, we even have some now. And to say you have to love them is not an easy thing to say. Even if you can't love them, they have to be treated like Selim Elohim. Even unlovable other human beings have to be translated like the, treated like the image of God. But it may also be that the Ahavta Lereacha Kamocha, love your neighbor as yourself. Maybe it was just your Jewish neighbor. Maybe it was just your Frum neighbor. Maybe it was just a Safmer Chassid, but not a Belzer Chassid, you know? Um, maybe it was an Ashkenazi, but not a Sfaradi. Uh, when Ben Azai says it goes back to the creation of human beings, it is without exception every human being. Nobody is left out. And so that's the Klal Gadol. Everything else in the Torah has to be judged according to its, klal, according to its conformity to the Klal Gadol. Does this verse or this mitzvah Conform to the Klal Gadol? Does it bring more people into the realm of being seen as and being treated as image of God? If it doesn't, you must be reading it wrong. You better go reinterpret that verse because it doesn't fit the Klal Gadol. I want to say this is not about making the Torah conform to our modern Western democratic values. This is about making the Torah conform to its own Klal Gadol. Uh, which has been around for a long time. And it's to me, along with Anochi Lo Yelecha, these are sort of the basis of the basis of Judaism as I as I have constructed it for myself out of these out of these little pieces. Now this Klal Gadol, this Telemelohim is something else too. It is why I have insisted that it is important for us to humanize God. Ultimately, I believe in the faceless one, the underlying oneness of being, the one that is present in all of us and in all things. But we need to see it with a human face. We need to see it with a human face because that's what allows for us to understand that we too are Tzalem Elohim. We need to be able to relate to it with intimacy. And so we give it a human face. Now the Kabbalists would say, because we need to relate to it with intimacy, God gave God's self a human face. In Sof brought about Kutsha Brechu. In Sof out of the womb of Bina gave birth to that, to that fellow on the throne, to that, to that image of the Blessed Holy One. I say we have we are the source of it but it doesn't make any difference really. I learned it from a, a, a rabbi I ran into one day, a Rabbi Rothenberg in Los Angeles many years ago. He was a shtickle Hasidic Rebbe. He was sort of a, an inical of a Hasidic Rebbe, lived in Los Angeles. And he said to me, you wanna know something? Look, and he gave me the sources, look in the Atheris Tzvi, 
by the by the Zidat Shaver in, in Parshas Achrei. He is going to he quotes the Apter Rav, which was of course Heschel's great 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 grandfather, and um, and, and there it says the Apter Rav. It's just a few lines. The Apter Rav quotes the verse in Dvarim in Parshat Ekev, Ma Hashem Elokecha Shuel Mimcha. What does God want of you? What does God want of you? He says Ma is Gematria Adam. What God wants of you is Adam. And you might think that's very nice. God wants you to be a mensch, which is quite lovely. God wants what God wants Adam of you before anything else. But then he says, no, it means Adam ala kisei. It means the man on the throne, the image that Ezekiel sees, the highest image the prophet sees. He sees, remember, when he gets to the when he gets to the to, to the great vision, he sees, he sees a throne in heaven and he sees. An image like a man is on the throne. And he says, you put them, you put him there. That's what God wants of you, Adam al say God wants you to put Adam al say And that was a crucial sort of theological breakthrough moment for me. Uh, realizing, yes, that is projection. And that's exactly what we need to do. And... Um, and so Tzelem Elohim, Tzelem Elohim means that we are in God's image, God is in our image. God creates human beings in God's image. We are obliged to return the favor. Um, many years after I thought I had said that, I found it in Hillel Cyclin exactly. And so that's, uh, that's, how, that's how the Tzelem works for me. Um, the third, The place where you are standing is holy ground. That, of course, is said to Moses at the, at the burning bush. It's a place out there in, in the wilderness of Midian. It's not an Eretz Yisrael. It's not the temple. Uh, it's just a place that's that, that, that holy in that moment. But the place where you are standing, Hamakom, of course, is the name for God. So therefore, that place is also God. God is found in that place. Wherever you are standing, that's holy ground. You don't have to go anyplace else. It doesn't have to be Yerushalayim. It doesn't even have to be the top of Cadillac Mountain, which is a very beautiful place in my life. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a special place. It just has to be the place where you are standing. And your standing there, of course, has something to do with it being with it being holy ground. There's a verse in the Psalms that we say in uh, in uh, in Shacharit in Uvalitzion. It's been important for me lately. Vata kadosh yoshev tehilot Yisrael. Vata kadosh yoshev tehilot Yisrael. You, O Holy One, dwell amid the prayers of Israel. Where is God? Where is God to be found? Right there in our prayers. The way God used to be called Yosef HaKruvim, he sat on the cherubim. Remember the cherubim, the kruvim were a seat. God would come down and sit down on the seat. God was Yosef HaKruvim. Now God is Yosef Tilot Yisrael. God dwells amid the prayers of Israel. And this takes me to something else I could have listed here, but there was uh, there wasn't room for it in the five, but it's part of this, a favorite teaching about prayer that uh, I read from Rabbi Pinchas of Koretz, uh, a, a friend of the Baal Shem Tov, who said, I quoted this many times, many of you have heard me say it, I'm sure, in Hebrew, Ha'olam svurin shemitpalin lifnei ha'kadosh baruchu ve'eno ken. People think you pray to God, and that is not the case. But prayer itself is of the divine essence. Your praying is a holy act. Your opening your heart is making a throne for the divine, which will come a light on that throne. And that is, that is the Makom Kadosh. That is the place of holiness because it's the place where you stand. So uh, understanding that, understanding that about 
every place and every place in the metaphorical sense, every existential situation place um, can be holy ground, is holy ground. All we have to do is open ourselves to it. All we have to do is discover it. That all of course is a life's work, but, uh, but that's what we're here for. That's what we're here for. And that takes me, that takes me to the fourth of these five. No, that's you, you skipped one. Go back one. That's right, that's right. This, now I go to Rabbi Nachman. Rabbi Nachman in, his, in, the, in the wonderful story of the seven beggars um, says, I'm gonna read it in Hebrew, in this wonderful edition by Tzvi Mark of uh, Nachman's, Nachman's Tales. The whole davar yesh lo lev. The whole davar yesh lo lev. Everything has a heart. The gam ha'olam bichlalo yesh lo lev. And the world itself has a heart. V'zeh lev shel ha'olam uko ma And this heart of the world has a whole form. In panim v'yadayim v'raglayim v'chol lev. It has a face. It has hands, it has feet. But the toenail of that heart of the world is more heart-like, is more heart than anything else in the world, than any other heart. So that sense of the heart of the world, you've all heard me teach that the journey to God is not a journey up, but a journey in. Or that both up and in are metaphors, but in our generation, the in makes more sense. The in metaphor makes more sense than the vertical metaphor. Um, everything in the world has a heart and the world itself has a heart. God is the heart of the world. And you go into that heart. And you go into that heart by opening your own heart which is to say in the language of the Zohar, Kula Talia, everything depends on love. It's all about love. I think for me, the religious life is all about love. I don't think there's any other motivation left. Why do you, why do we live as Jews? Why do we, why have I remained within the realm of the tradition? I could have walked away. There were times I wanted to try to walk away. Sometimes I remember Bialik Samatmi, the last, the last guy left living in the empty, desolate Beit Midrash, and and sort of the sort of the Shekhinah plead, pleading with him not to leave. But uh, it feels more like a plea than a command. But um, but it's also because all the other motivations, the motivation of fear, God's going to punish you if you don't do it. The, motion, the, 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 the motivation of guilt, you can't do this. You can't do this because of the Holocaust. You can't do it. You can't do this because, because, of, your, because of, your, of, your, of, of, of your grandparents. You can't do this because of this and that. It's all gone. There's only love left. And I'm here because I love this tradition and want to carry it on. And all I can say to my students is not Judaism is better than all other religions in the world because or or this is the truth and nobody else has the truth. But all I can say is, this is a language I love and I want to share it with you. And uh, for the folks who are here, I see there are quite a few of you, it seems to have worked pretty well. I think it's the only strategy we have. It's all about love. And what Judaism has become for me is a language that works to open my heart. magic, his personal history, vulnerability. I can't tell you which of those it is or what the combination of those it is. Of course, it's all of those. But, um, but there's a language of the heart and a language for opening the heart. And I believe the individual, the individual heart at some point gives way to the heart of the world. As I always like to emphasize, the journey inward is not a journey to the self. It's precisely a journey towards self-transcendence. 
But self-transcendence happens by an inner process. And it begins with opening the heart. And uh, realizing that that heart, of course, that our human individual heart is just, uh, as Alman would say, it's a workstation from the mainframe computer of the cosmos. But since I'm not much of a computer metaphor guy, I'll stay, I'll pull back from that one and say, it's an outer lavush of the, of the inner heart of the world. Um, so that's number four, it's all about the heart. And now the fifth, let's see if we get it right. Yes, it becomes collective. Vatem tiyuli mamlechet kohanim v'goy kadosh. I am, I am committed to Jewish existence. I am committed to the existence of the Jewish people and the continuity of the Jewish people. But I think it has to be a purposeful existence. We signed up at Mount Sinai, again, metaphoric or historical, however you want it. We signed up at Sinai to be a Mamlechet Kohanim. Um, to be a kingdom of priests means a priest is there to serve others. A priest is not just there for his own soul. A priest is there to serve. So we are dedicated, we are collectively dedicated to a career of service. That's what Mamlechet Kohanim means. That's all the chosenness means. We have chosen, I understand it as we have chosen. We have seen ourselves as chosen to serve as a kingdom of priests. And that means, yes, we have something to give. I don't think we have the only truth, but we have the single universal truth of the oneness of being in a language that preserves and passes on many important human values. Some of them are in this five sim that I've given you. Uh, we are dedicated to that. A Jewish existence that betrays that belies Jewish existence. Whether that is a Jewish existence of self-satisfied upper middle-class American life, or the Jewish existence of a Jewish state that engages in wholesale arms trafficking around the world, or a Jewish existence that sees Jews as superior to other people and looks down on others, all of those are betrayals of that Mamlechet Kohanim. All of those are turnings toward Avodah Zarah turnings toward worship nothing else as a God. All those are betrayals of the mission. We are engaged in a great struggle for the soul of this tradition, a great and frightening struggle for the soul of this tradition, no less than the generation before Khurban Bayit Sheni, before the destruction of the second temple was engaged in a great struggle for the soul of the tradition. Partly it's the same struggle still going on. Is it about an exclusive nationalist truth that's only about us and implies a kind of superiority and condescension toward others? I don't have to tell you how much the roots of a certain degree of racism can be found in that kind of reading of Jewish chosenness. Mordechai Kaplan knew it well and was very honest about it and therefore tried to step away from it entirely. I can't quite do it that way, but I too want to be very honest about what the dangers of a misreading of Vatem Tiyuli Am Sugula, the verse that immediately follows this one. It says, you will be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, because you are a sgula for me among all nations. And that's where the whole notion of chosenness comes from, but it comes directly, directly associated with this notion of kingdom of priests. So we're in a great struggle with people who think it means Jewish superiority or unique Jewish privilege. And uh, 
being part of that fight is something that uh, I have devoted myself to much of my life. My writing and teaching have to do with a stance about how to read this tradition. It's a stance I received from my teachers. I should have begun probably talking about my teachers because much of what I do in my life is about my teachers. You know, I was, I was privileged to be an American Jewish kid who was just the right age to benefit from the great group of teachers whom Hitler cast up on these shores and who recreated Jewish scholarship in America. Um, my teachers, when I, was, when I was a child in Newark, New Jersey, the local rabbi was Joachim Prince from Berlin, who had fled Germany early because he defied Hitler publicly. When I got a little too frum for him, I went to Max Duenwald, his brother-in-law, who was in Milburn, New Jersey, and had been rabbi of Mannheim. Uh, when I was uh, only 16, I went off to Brandeis and immediately took a course, took course with Nachum Glatzer who had been Franz Rosenzweig's closest disciple. A couple of years later, Alexandra Altman came to Brandeis and taught the first class on Jewish mysticism ever taught in American University. And I was privileged to be in, a student in that class. Uh, when I got to, when I uh, graduated college after a year in Israel, I went to study at JTS and had the great privilege of, of course, being uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel's private student for four years. Uh, they were all people who came from that middle European educational world with some Eastern Europe in the background, but they had all been shaped by a kind of, by a kind of uh, Western and deeply Jewish at the same time notion of what the tradition was about. And it is, uh, it is a legacy I have tried to carry on. Uh, in some ways I rebelled against them by going to Hasidism. I, when I was in college, modern Jewish thought was all about things that happened in Germany and the United States. Eastern Europe was ignored. Uh, there was no idea that Eastern European Jew had anything to say that was interesting about modern Judaism, except maybe for Pinsker and Achad Am. And discovering that the Rabbi Nachman of Bratslav and the Swas Emes and the Mori Naim had important things to say to modern Jews was a big part of my career, is a big part of my career but it's all in the spirit of my teachers. So I've given you five principles. Um, uh, two commandments directly from God. The basic rule of Torah, the image of God. The place where you stand is holy ground, the heart of the world and the kingdom of priests. Those are five principles. You remember the Chamushim Alu Bnei Yisrael Meretz Mitzrayim. It doesn't mean they came up with their Chumashim. It means with these five things, you come out of Egypt. These five things liberate you. Chamushim Alu Bnei Yisrael Meretz Mitzrayim. But these five, these five principles are very nice, but they only give you one of the two tablets and we have to make the whole tablets. So the second side of the, of the 10, the second five, I give you from a traditional source. And Shani, you'll be good enough to put this one up, the last one. This is Tshuva. When I, was, when I was traveling in the Ukraine, I had the great privilege of traveling in the Ukraine and visiting the, some of the Hasidic holy sites, as you know from reading about them in my book, perhaps, with a dear group of Talmudim and friends. Um, we visited the graves of both Rabbi Pinchas of Koretz and Rabbi Zusha of Anipol. As it happens, I found the same teaching in both of their names and was very important to me. Uh, they said, Teshuvah, what is Teshuva? What does it mean to return to God? And they said, Teshuva is an abbreviation. And it stands for these five principles. You see them, the first letter is, is, is darkened. Tamim Tihyeh, Shaviti Hashem, 
I want to say just a brief word about each of them. Be wholehearted. That means be honest. Be honest about your religious life. Don't pretend to believe in things you don't believe in. There's no, there's no reward for that. I've tried, I've tried to be, I've tried to create a Jewish religious language that is honest and spiritually alive at the same time. For me, it's only spiritually alive because it's honest. And that's what tamim means, intellectual honesty, integrity in what you say and what you teach. Shiviti Hashem Lemidi Tamid, of course, that's what a Shiviti is. That's what a meditation chart is in Hebrew, a chart that has the Shem on it. The name Yud Hevave always before me, the name Yud Hevave is what I insist on. You know, I don't like the English word G O D and don't feel much loyalty to it. But Yud Hevave is that impossible confl conflation of the verb to be of Haya Hove Yehiyeh all smushed together into a noun that doesn't exist otherwise. I like to translate it is, was, will be. And I like to remember that as the Torah says, if you think you've got God in a little box because you now have a noun, you'd have, hey, remember God has already said, I'll be whatever I want to be. You will not catch me in a nominal box. You will not make me a thing. Yudhei Vavi is not a thing. It's not an entity. It is. And that's the name to keep ever before you. We've spoken of already. Yes, yes, there is a neighbor who's closer than Kol Adam. There's a neighbor that's, who's closer. Who's closer than Selim Elohim. You do have a neighbor. There is somebody who's close to you, who's part of your community who's part of your people. And loving in a special way is all right, especially because you love that neighbor as part of yourself. That's how I understand Kamocha, that I can give you the Hasidic sources for it. Understand, love your neighbor because your neighbor is, is part of you. You are part of the same one. Behold Rachecha Da'ihu is the verse from Proverbs it's most quoted in Hasidism about serving God through everything. Avodat Hashem is not just about Torah and mitzvot. It's not just about the forms of Judaism. It's not just about the commandments. Behold, Rachech who know God in everything you do. And Da'ehu, unite the He and the Vav, if, you're, if you've got a little Kabbalistic urge in you, Da'ehu. But of course, da'ehu yada is also from the word yada in Hebrew and the word da'at in Hebrew always carries with it the first use of that word yada in the Torah, v'adam yada at chava It means intimate knowledge. It means the knowledge with which Adam knew his wife Eve. So it means, it means perform the yichud, perform unification, be in an intimate place with the one in everything you do. And that's Nealechet. Walk humbly with your God. That's what uh, that's what the Talmud says. Micha reduced the whole tradition to the whole Torah to was Hatsnealechet Imelohecha, walking humbly with your God. Now you might say when we look back on this list, hey, he didn't talk about Judaism. Where's Shabbos? Where's mitzvahs? Where's study of Torah? Uh, to me, those are all the means to this, to these values. That's how I do it. People sometimes complain that Judaism doesn't tell you how. Jewish mystics don't give you instructions on how to achieve a higher state or how to become one with God or how to enter Dvekut. And I think that's true. That's true. There is not much talk about method. First you do this, then you do that. Close your eyes. 
close your eyes and do this. There isn't much talk of that because they thought of, that's what the whole tradition is about. That's what it's all about, all the mitzvot and the act of Talmud Torah are about that intimacy and are about that immediate sense of presence. Those are the means, these are the ends. So that's the job. The job for me is, uh, is keeping those as means and not letting them become ends in, itself, in themselves. When they become ends in themselves, I have no doubt that mitzvot can also become avodah zarah, can also become false gods. If they become ends in themselves, you worry about, you worry about, the, about the how and the details and not about where they're supposed to take you. So the job has been trying to do that in my life, to find my way back to, back to more whole observance and at the same time to understand that it's, all, that it's all a means to these ends and to expressing these things I've been sharing with you. So that's, uh, that's what it's all about. Those are, my, uh, those are my 10 for tonight. Elsewhere, I've, I've had the terrible chutzpah to, uh, to write 13 Ikarim, uh, 13, 13 uh, Credo of 13 Principles of neo Hasidism. Here I have even greater chutzpah to, to give you 10, to give you 10 on two luchot. But uh, I ask to be forgiven since I ended with Hatznei Alechet. I hope I won't be seen as being too prideful in doing this. And, uh, and I hope that, uh, that some of these fragments will be meaningful to you. Uh, your your set of fragments is going to be different than mine, um, precisely because we, uh, uh, Shana, can you take it down? Your set of fragments will be different than mine because each of us is a different person on a unique journey. And we're going to find different pieces of those shivrei luchot, of those broken tablets to put together. And that's all for the good. Maybe one of you will find shatnas to be terribly meaningful, something I've never paid attention to, but there it is. There it is, it's a piece of the tradition. And uh, go for it, a different piece than mine. Um, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, the word mikveh was known to me only because of certain Yiddish jokes and remarks in the family. I never knew anyone who went to one, but my goodness, all kinds of, all kinds of, all kinds of uh, women and men in our generation are finding mikveh meaningful in ways that my, that my grandmother's Tante Shushka never would have dreamed of. And uh, so, uh, so yes, um, pick up the fragments, try to puzzle it out and see what, uh, what, what whole tablets you make of them. Thank you for listening. I now want to have the great privilege of, of listening to my dear uh, and highly, highly esteemed friend, Michael Fishbane. Thank you so much, Buzzy, for, for agreeing to do this tonight. Shalom. So it's, it's a very great pleasure, Art, both to um, see your face at 80 and to see within that face the face that I remember for over 55, almost 60 years ago, uh, when we first met, um, the, uh, the tsuras upon him, <laughs> the, uh, the shape of the face doesn't change, um, and the voice doesn't change. And I think that um, hearing you uh, tonight uh, is a great pleasure and a privilege uh, to to realize that one can live in these uh, difficult and broken times with integrity. Um, and one is, it's the striving for integrity. Perhaps one of the things you didn't mention is the striving. It's that issue of the quest. That each of these pieces of the 10 have been put together uh, with honesty and pain and prayer and fellowship. And they've been put together with a chevraya, not just with a single self, but you had the vision to try to balance between the subjective and the objective. Um, because I'm seeing your face and I'm remembering faces from the 60s when we first met, perhaps I should um, share with everybody, you said so much about your anima amin, that, and I wanna leave everybody with your voice, but I do wanna add a couple of things to what you said very briefly because the hour is late. 
But I remember the first time that we met, it was in the mid 60s uh, at the Jewish Theological Seminary. And I was um, in New York for a very scholarly conference. And uh, someone asked me to come upstairs because people were going to be talking about a chavura and about a spiritual group. Uh, and would I want to listen to the discussion? And uh, I was in those days filled with philology and uh, stuffed to the gills with languages. Um, but uh, there was something magnetic about that pool. And I remember going up the stairs and we sat around and people were trying to be honest about what a seminary should do for a person and not just convey abstract knowledge or not just convey academic uh, knowledge, but how learning can make a person into a person, into a Torah, into a living Torah. And I remember Art um, speaking about his personal study with, with, uh, with Heschel and the feeling that we weren't doing enough in the 60s to step out with the Berrigan brothers to uh, respond with social justice, to respond with a spiritual group that would learn a new language of prayer, that would learn a new language of being together. And that discussion, which took place with multiple voices, with some extraordinary people in that room who were all as conflicted as we were, but it was in that conflict that we created something holy and your voice and your presence was always central. Uh, you concluded what you were uh, saying about the teachers. And I, uh, I just wanna mention a couple of words about that. As I was thinking about you and your legacy, um, I was thinking about the issue of Kinyan. What does it mean to have a Kinyan? And of course, in the halachic tradition, one has to first be a receiver before you can be a giver. And people like Art and myself were not like our teachers. Our teachers had this with their mother's milk. They were saturated. And we had to learn how to come and appropriate, to receive the tradition from our teachers. But receiving halakhically is you have to lift it up and take it into yourself. You can't, it doesn't simply remain in the other domain. The other's domain, was their life, it was the way it appeared in their texts, in a way it appeared in their reality. But they were handing it to us and we had to lift it and take it into ourselves. And there's another aspect of Kinyan, it's not Kinyan, it's not simply to bring that into your spiritual reality, but it's the word Kana means also to create. Kone Shemayim Va'aretz. There has to be a new moment of creativity. The taking over has to respect what we receive, but to find the new voice. Uh, and you spoke um, very much and very movingly about what it means you know, uh, in the Zohar, of course, if you can get to all those 50 rungs, you find a mafteach and you can go in. And you've given all of us here who haven't merited all that work, a mafteach into the tradition. But what I do wanna to say to people, and you had asked me also to convey something to your students, I do want your students to realize how much hard work you put in to learning the tradition. The tradition just doesn't come and flow. There is an enormous amount of spiritual labor and I'm sure your students have read, but they should understand that your, your study and your publications cover Midrash, they cover the early Middle Ages, they cover the Middle Ages of Kabbalah and beyond, and they cover the modern period and images that flow from antiquity to the modern period. And you learn all of this skill set to learn that in order to choose and in order to integrate personally, you've taught us or you've repeated in your life that a person has to put in the hard work and the hard work takes place in privacy and you just can't grab something 
you've given us the gift of this, these enormous anthologies, these enormous syntheses, these enormous integrations. But everybody should realize that they come through spiritual struggle. Every single one of your works is reflecting your encounter with the history of religion, your encounter with the history of tradition, your encounter with comparative religions, and your integration of this, uh, whether you were talking about certain aspects of Midrash and linking them up to the way Christian traditions were being rejected, or whether you go to the Shekhinah in the Middle Ages and how people could see how the traditions are, uh, have parallels with Christian symbolism of, sh of Shira Shirim, or the kind of phenomenology of the inner spiritual life. You have shown us not just the spiritual content, you've shown us the hard work of how to integrate the history of the academic world and to make it personal. I think one of the greatest things that I learned from you personally, and I learned it uh, in the Chavara, um, was how to be a teacher and how to balance the subjective and the objective. How to learn the kalim, to receive the kind of technicalities of the tradition, but to give it a personal voice. And then also to have the courage to realize that the tradition doesn't come ready-made. We have to make selections. We have to make choices. And you've given us the model of the power of selection. It says, kol Hashem bakoach, but the Mechilda says, everybody has their own koach. The mysterious word koach is not just strength, it means ability, it means capacity, it means potentiality. It means everything that a human being can bring to that. So when I look at you, Art, um, and what you've done, um, I'm grateful for the way that you've taught us to speak in a, a voice of integrity. I'm grateful for the way that you have not abandon the hard work of academic work right to the very end of what you're doing now is even in your work in Hasidism, you have turned more to the sociological and the historical and the nuts and bolts of what it means to walk on the earth in a very specific concrete way. And you have shown us that one doesn't have to give up the academic world and the spiritual world. One has to find a modality of integration. And you have become, and you remain, this great, this great model for us um, of what it means to be a safer Torah. You talked about putting the luchot the shivrei haluchot. But the greater ideal of tradition is that one has to become a safer Torah and to treat other people as a safer Torah. And your life is a safer Torah filled with different kinds of uh, levels. So as you are, have gevurot, um, I give this, uh, I, in the name of all of us, I say and so that we could continue to learn from you and may your voice continue to be a coal that is broken into 70 pieces and all the languages so that people of different levels, different traditions and different ears and different hearts can all resonate and grow with a heart of wisdom. Thank you for being my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Amen, amen. <laughs> Don't go away. I'll be right back. I have to show you something. <laughs> this is suspenseful. Yeah. God knows what he's going to bring. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's a safe there. I'm sure it's. I should, I should have had the. I should have had this next to me and didn't. My advanced copy of the uh, translation of the Marinayim arrived during Pesach, all 860 pages of it. Uh, so it's now available from Stanford University Press. And beginning a week from today, beginning next Monday afternoon at 1, I'll be teaching an eight session course using the translation. If anybody wants to sign up, you can find it on the Hebrew College website. I have now done my commercial announcement. But uh, it would be great to see. It'd be great to see any of you, any of you there, and uh, and um, this was a good five years of my life. The translation, the translation part has been a very important part of what I've given myself to, and I feel very, very good about that. Mm.
Sharon. Uh, thank you so much. I have to say, I think Arnie Winchell um, put it best at some point in the chat when she said that this whole evening feels like such an act of generosity and um, we're really grateful, um, grateful for it. Uh, since you made a pitch about the book, I'll make a pitch also and just say, um, just remind people that Art is not accepting gifts for his birthday, but um, we are accepting donations to support his continued work. Um, there's a, an Art Green Research Fund at Hebrew College and you're more than invited and welcome to contribute to that. Um, I just want to add um, sort of one more bracha um, myself to close out the evening. And um, Art, I'm so struck by and moved by your choice to sort of speak to us through fragments tonight. Um, and there's something about that that feels very much connected to what you said about um, when you said, uh, sort of the language that you seek and try to teach is only spiritually alive because it's honest and inviting us to do the same. And um, you reminded me in sort of speaking about the fragments and the Shivrei Aluchot of um, a Bialik essay that you know, Chaim Nachman Bialik essay that you know that I hold very dear uh, called Gilui V'Kisui V'Lashon, Revealment and Concealment and Language. Um, where he sort of talks about the language of poetry as um, uh, sort of learning to learning to walk on um, pieces, blocks of ice crossing a river, you, you know, that we're not walking on solid ground and we have to kind of um, learn to walk on those blocks of ice. So maybe there's some connection between the the blocks of ice and the fragments of the luchot. Um, but he also ends that essay by saying, and so I want to offer this actually in, in, the, form, in the form of bracha to you. Um, he closes that essay by uh, saying, in addition to the language of words, there are yet to the Lord languages without words, songs, tears, and laughter. And the speaking creature has been found worthy of them all. And then he goes on to say, every creation of the spirit which lacks an echo of one of th these three languages is not really alive. And it were best that it had never come into the world. And so um, I just was thinking about that as you were speaking and feel that um, feeling that part of what makes your language and your teaching so alive for us is its honesty and the ways in which it carries the echoes of, of those three languages um, of tears of laughter and of song. And so, um, you know, maybe that's part of the, um, the secret of, of this capacity, extraordinary capacity for chidush, for ongoing renewal um, that you have. And so my bracha tonight at this, you know, on this occasion of your 80th is just to bless you with that continued capacity that you have for chidush, for hidchadshut, um, that you, you model and teach so beautifully. And um, so I'll close with sort of a adaptation of just a few words from a poem by uh, Zeitlin, Halat Zeitlin, um, uh, mm -hmm. that I think I learned from you and you've talked about him as the closest thing you have to a Rebbe. And uh, it's of course from uh, the Oda Pam, um, but um, paraphrasing him, Nesham Becha Minishmat Apo, Vechaita Chaim Chadashim. May you come to life anew with every breath that you draw from the breath of all life. Amen. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you all, Erev Tov. Erev Tov. Wonderful to you all. Many more happy to be, maybe be together for many more happy occasions in the future. Amen. Amen. Mine and all of yours. Amen. 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 Beautiful.
Call it Kavod. Kavod, boy. I tell you, I'm sending a thing right now to Sharon. Yom Huladet Sameach. Haven't seen each other so we, since we both left Israel uh, a year and a half ago. But uh, we will soon. Are you in Israel now? I'm here now. I'll be in Israel in August, September, and then again next winter, I think. Good. So I will see you uh, next winter, God yes, willing. Okay. Bezrat Hashem. Let's hope. Hazal. So it's Nachum Tversky wanting to wish you Nachum. Yom Uledet Sameach. Thank you, thank you. I'm probably the only uh, descendant here of your precious Sefer that I look forward to its translation. You never can and... tell, but probably. I miss, I miss, I miss Gail Reamer is also here. She might be. She he was. Might be. Gail was yeah. here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hi, uh, hi everybody, Nehemia, Sherry, Eddie, Lewis Mintz. Nice to see you, Lewis. It's been a long time. Yeah, great to great to great to see everybody. Masalto, Masalto, Masalto. As I scroll through the pictures, Aria, I'm glad you made it. Thank you. Hi, Jeff Soltar. Hi, Michael Brooks. Hi, uh, <laughs> great to see, great to see people. It's great. Lewis, nice to see you. It was good to be here. So great. Bye. 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 Okay. Hey to leave, hate to leave this party, but I guess we have to. Yeah. Bye, Rato. Bye, Rato. Bye, Rato. See you soon. Love you, Zalto.